It's good to be with you this morning. God bless you guys. I, uh, I do want to recognize some pretty important people in my life. I asked every one of them in the van right over us, did any of you want to come up and say anything? And they all resoundingly said no. So uh, they let me be the spokesperson. But this is my wife, Mimi. We've been married for 22 years. And uh, I know. She's getting younger, and I don't know how she's doing it, but she, uh, she just is. I don't know. And uh, so that's my son, Ethan. He's 14. And that's my daughter, Lila. She's 11. That's Ethan's girlfriend. Her name is Bree. She comes to church with us every week, and we're glad to have her with us. And uh, yeah, they're, uh, I'm glad to have them with me this morning. And I'm so glad to be here, and uh, thank you for the honor of being here. 2018 was the last time I was here, and i um, been on a journey since then and went through some things and stepped back from, th- from things for a little while and focused on my family, and, and God's been very gracious to us. And um, after 22 years, my wife and I still really love each other. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. And uh, so I, I've, I've been in a different season. We are uh, planted in Lithia, Florida. I work with my brother there. My, my dad and I started a church there in 2011. And my brother uh, is one of the main leaders there. So he and I worked together in a small little church there in Lithia, Florida. But I went from traveling all the time in 2018 to preaching once a year outside of our church. Uh, So this is literally like the second or third time of the whole year that I'll actually leave to go somewhere else to preach. So I uh, don't do it often. And I told him on Friday night, it means I got a lot built up. So y'all about to catch all of it. So I, uh, no, I'm kidding. Well, Six o'clock prayer meeting, that'll be good. Well, it's tran- I'm just kidding, just playing, <laughs> just kidding. The Lord's been speaking to me for a little while now, and I really believe that uh, as I've been praying and seeking the Lord for uh, the meeting on Friday night with the leaders, the core team of the church, and then for this morning as well, I'm so, so grateful to be here. And, you know, I, I feel like in my spirit, God's positioning this church for something very beautiful. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm not just, I'm not a fluffy words guy. You'll find pretty quickly that, you know, I don't, I'm not, try, I don't flatter people. I'm not impressed with people. You know, people aren't impressed with me either. And that's fine. Uh, one of the things that happened in the last five years is I had to go to the cross and crucify what you thought about me. Um, Cause it motivated my decisions way too much. And uh, so now I don't really care what you think. And, uh, but I love you. And, um, but I believe that God's positioning this church for some very beautiful things. I think that you, uh, what I have felt is over the last couple of years, there's been some, tra- you've been in transition. I know that in the natural. I know that there's been changes and shifting and things have happened and things like that. And, um, and you've, you've done well. You've, you've navigated these things. Your eldership has navigated these seasons well. And uh, what I believe, though, is that God's positioning this church for a release of his glory that is going to be unprecedented to anything that your church has ever experienced before. That's good news. Because his glory is his presence. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to do anything apart from his presence. Nothing. I've been in his presence and I've done things outside of it. And I'm going to tell you, in his presence is way, way better. I'm learning the revelation been resounding in my spirit for, for weeks now is just, and I, I, I think it's becoming a living reality for me personally. And I believe for the body of Christ, where I said it just a little while ago, where Jesus is becoming preeminent again in the church. He's becoming the preeminent one. That means he's got the first place of authority in the church. It means that every decision we make, everything that we do, we filter it through. What does he think about this? Not what does, what does the congregation think? What is my opinion on this thing? What does he think? Is he going to be blessed by this? Is this going to glorify and lift up the name of Jesus? Or is it just going to make us feel better? So he's got to be preeminent. But I'm learning more and more. And I, I want you to hear this because we, if you grow up in church like I did, and I cut my teeth on church pews. My dad's in his 42nd year of ministry. My parents are missionaries. They spent half the year in Mexico, in Reynosa, Mexico. My dad has preached all over the world, uh, literally, to thousands and thousands of people. He's seen thousands of miracles. I grew up in that my whole life. 
So I've known nothing but the church. I've known nothing but the things of God. So I've heard every scripture. I've heard everything that preachers like to throw out to get emotional response and all that stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm getting somewhere. Hang on with me. Better is one day with him. Better is one day, one moment in his glory than a thousand days spent doing anything else. Better is one day. And we've got to rediscover that and we've got to capture that in our hearts because life is going to happen to every one of us. As we are sitting here, life is happening to us. And we're going to have to make decisions whether we're going to keep him first or not. Whether we're really going to believe what we say. Whether we're really going to walk in this thing that we've been called to or if we're really going to create a place for him. And I believe that if we'll build a house for him, he's going to fill it with his glory. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning with you. So I'm going to read some verses to you, but I'm going to kind of overview a few chapters to you. Because if we'd be here all day, if I tried to dissect them chapter by chapter, I'd love to, but we don't have enough time. Second Chronicles, starting in chapter 2, Solomon has been, uh, he's received this responsibility. David had it in his heart to build a house for God. It was in David's heart to do this thing for God. It was, a, it was a pure heart that he wanted to do that. He, I'm living in this palace. I'm living in God's presence is living in a tent and it bothered David. I want to build a house for him. It's not right that I'm living in this palace. I'm living in this, this luxury and the presence of God is, is out in the, in the open. It's out in this tent and he, it bothered him. So he, he wanted to build a house for God. And so you guys know the story that the prophet comes to him and says, because your hands have shed blood, you can't build a house for God. But David said, I'm not going to let that stop me from making every preparation so that the next generation can build what's in my heart. And God is speaking now to the body of Christ that this, this compartmentalization that we've created in the church, God is dealing with it where the generations don't honor one another and the older don't like the way the younger does it and the younger don't like the way the older does it. And we, we don't honor, I'm telling you, God is establishing honor in the house of God. Where generations come together, Paul, when he laid out the foundation for the church, he, he established that the older would teach the younger. Older women in the church teach the younger women modesty and, and, and how to keep their homes and how to be women of God and how to be good mothers and all those things. And, and, and fathers, he spoke to the older men to teach the young men to be, to be resolute, to be honorable, to be, to be godly, to, to lead their homes in righteousness. And we've lost that somewhere along the way because we, we are so advanced in our technology now. We're so advanced in our methods that we think that we've evolved beyond the deposit that the older generation can give us. And I believe God's wanting to address that because David had it in his heart to do something for God and he wanted it to go beyond what he could do in his generation. So his willingness to invest and lay up for created the opportunity for the next generation to build something for God that David wasn't able to build. And that's okay. This thing is growing. This kingdom is expanding. It's growing. It's, it's, it's increasing. The kingdom of God is increasing in the earth. The kingdom of God is increasing. And it's not increasing because we build more churches. We've got plenty of those. It's increasing when the people of God start understanding that the kingdom of God resides within them. You are the expression of the kingdom of God. It's not some, it's not some building made with hands. We're making God a spiritual house. Fitly joined together creating a place for him. And I believe that as you honor the presence of God and as you make room for him, he's going to fill this place with glory. Hallelujah. So in chapter two, he starts building this house. He has a, a literally a storehouse full of gold and resource and all of these things that his father laid up for him to build this place for God. David didn't let the limitation stop him from investing into what God was going to do. Even though he couldn't do it, he kept laying up a, a treasure, a treasure, a legacy, a treasure for the next generation to take what he invested in and build something for God. That's powerful. That's beautiful. I walk in that in my life. My parents aren't wealthy people. 
They've never had a lot of money. We've lived by faith our whole life. I had like three years where my dad stopped traveling, preaching, and sold real estate. God gave us a season where he came to be home with me and my brothers and helped raise us and develop us and invest in us. And he's always been active in our lives. But that was the only time that I, I could, we had nice stuff and our, we had a new car and all that stuff. That's the only time. Everything else we'd ever had was given to us. I lived that way. So I don't, my parents... You know, they're in their 60s now, and one day they're going to go be with the Lord. And a, a long time from now, I pray to God. I hope, hope it's a long, long time from now. Not ready for that. But when they die, I, I know I've resolved in my mind, I'm not going to receive a million dollars. That's okay. But I've received an investment, a legacy of faith. Where as a seven-year-old boy, my dad saw me at the front of the church during the altar service when a lot of my friends were hiding under the church pews and their parents were chasing them down. I would sit on the front row and I would literally just watch, study what was happening. So my dad at seven years old, my dad called me to the front and he let me hold the microphone for him while he prayed for the sick. So at seven, I would stand beside him and hold a microphone like this so his hands could be free. To, and I saw blind eyes open and deaf ears hear. And I saw a lady push her wheelchair to her car that they pushed her in the service in. At seven years old, I saw my dad, when demons started manifesting, he didn't hide me. He didn't say, go run in the back of the church and take the kids to the nursery. He had let me stand right there as demons manifest and screamed as they came out of people. That's the, that's the inheritance. My dad was laying up an inheritance for me. It's more valuable than anything he's got in his bank account, I promise you. So don't, don't think that your labor's in vain today. I'm speaking to the older generation. I'm speaking to the younger generation. I, I believe that this, this kingdom of God, it's generational. It's multi-generational. It's not limited to one. I don't care how long you've been doing this, and I don't care how old you are. God's not done with you. There's a purpose, there's a plan, there's a destiny of God for you. There's something that is yet to be done. I, I got news for you. You can retire from your job. You don't retire from the kingdom. It doesn't happen. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. You can retire from the pastorate, but you aren't retiring from the call of God. God's hand is on you. He's put a spirit in you. Hallelujah. All right, let me get to it. Sorry. Second Chronicles chapter two, he begins to build this house. In the building of the house, God sends laborers. God sends workers, skilled laborers, gifted men, gifted in gold, gifted in craftsmanship. Solomon didn't know how to do all of it. Solomon just had the vision for what God wanted done. He had a blueprint for the house, but he didn't know how to go do it. I, I, I tell you, I used to work for a construction company. You didn't want me building your house. I was just really good at getting the right people in place to do what they were good at. You didn't want me building it, I promise you. I was just really good at organizing people, making sure they had what they needed, making sure that things were being done with excellence and, and that the, the, my crews weren't cutting corners. And I was really good at that part, but you didn't want me building it. But God sent Solomon men that were gifted and skilled in their labor, and they were, they were good at what they did. You've got, and, and I'm telling you, there is a part, there is a place for you in the house of God. There are things that God has deposited within you, and there's a function that only you can fill. We tend to look up here. We look up here. I, I'm going to just share something with you guys. And this is not a, this isn't to spotlight myself at all. I, listen, before this ever happened, I started doing this when I was 14, but I didn't do it all the time. Before any of this took place in my life, you know where I learned ministry? You know how I got to, to be around preachers? I found out that if I would make sure there was water in their glasses, they would let me in the room. I found out that if I would take their plate for them or I'd make sure they had what they needed, they'd let me hang around in the background. And I didn't go to Bible college. I learned what I learned serving in the house of God, 
stacking chairs, singing on the worship team. I was at church as a teenager five nights a week. I was on drama teams and I sang. I sang on the worship team and I was in this and I was in that and I was in the youth group and I was involved in everything going on. I lived at the house of God my whole life growing up. I didn't know anything else. It's where I lived. It's where I stayed. It's where I was. And it's deposits were being made in my heart and in my life. I learned my place. I learned my function. But before I ever functioned here, I had to learn how to function there. The point is, God's put something in you. There's a reason that you're here. There's not a person here that has been called to just come here on Sunday morning and warm that seat you're sitting in. Not one person. Whether you've been saved five days or you've been saved 50 years, you are here for a divine purpose. You're a member of a many-member body. You have a function in the body of Christ. I know this, Josh, is way too simple. I'm telling you, the reason God has me living here is because I don't see the church operating in it. We've heard it, but we don't live it. You have a place. There's a purpose. There's a plan. We want to, what keeps us from stepping into the, the reality of this thing? What keeps us, there's so many different things. We limit ourselves in our minds. We limit ourselves by comparison. We limit ourselves by, our, we, we look at how gifted someone else is and I could never do that. Man, I could never get up on that stage and speak in front of all these people. I could never do this. I could never do that. I'm not gifted that way. I'm not organizational that way. I'm not gifted like she is, or I'm not gifted like he is. And I've got this limitation and I don't have this education and I don't have this, but you've got the spirit of God in you. There's this, there's this factor that we leave out. God's in you. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God is in you. He has made a home in you. He resides in you. And the same power that quickened Jesus, that raised him out of the grave, is quickening you right now in your death through mortal body. Amen. All right. Let's get to it. He spared no expense. There was a spirit of excellence in everything that he did. He was building a house for God. He was doing something for God. Here's the transition. We've got to move beyond it being something for him and being something of him. This is the difference. In chapter 5 of 2 Chronicles, they've built it. They've built this. I mean, it was a wonder. It was a wonder. It was a, modern, it, was a, it was a modern wonder in their day. This house they built for God. I mean, we're talking columns laid in gold. We're talking about it was ornate. It was beautiful. It was extravagant because he spared no expense. I'm building a house for the God of heaven. And he even said, how could God fills everything? I love it. When he sent the, the in chapter two, he sent a word to a king asking for help and asking for workers and asking for skilled laborers. And, and in it, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to act like I'm going to build a house for God, but he fills everything. How can any man build a house for him? But I'm going to do my best. He built a house for him. And so chapter five, it's built. They've established it, it's built and it's beautiful and it's ornate and it's honoring to God. And it's something that people came from all over the world to see because it was so beautiful. But in verse 13 of chapter five, it says this, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with their trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. In that verse, a transition takes place. Up until that moment, they had built it for him. But the moment his glory filled it, it became a house of God. And I'm telling you, there is a line of distinction being drawn in the church of America today between a lot of things being done for him and what's actually being done of him. 
We do a lot of things in the name of we're doing this for God. We're shortening our services for God. We're, we're, we're making, we, we only preach salvation and we want to make sure everybody has a good experience for God. No, that's for man. Y'all need to hear me. I'm not trying to be critical today. But I'm telling you, we've got to get to the place where we're so in love with the truth of God, the depth of the word of God, where I can come up. Listen, if you're really seeker sensitive and you're, if, if someone is really seeking, they'll sit here for hours if they're really hungry. We've relegated it down to 30 minute sermons and sermonettes and, and motivational speaking. And we got to make sure people leave feeling good about themselves. The last thing you need for me to do is feed carnality in you. That's the last thing you need. It tastes good. It's sugary. It tastes real sweet, but it's killing you on the inside. Well, it feels good in the moment, but then life happens and you aren't ready. You're disappointed. You're disillusioned because I was told God's just good and everything's going to be great and everything's going to, and then guess what? Life's waiting for you when you walk out that door. And if I just give you sugary, flowery, just beds of ease. And Jesus said this, he was about to leave. And he told him, in this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He makes the difference. So we do a lot of things in the church today for God. And that's how we justify things. Well, we're doing this for God. We're doing this for God. But if you really boil it down to it, to the very core of what it is, it's to please people. It's to make people feel good. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm also not big on condemnation preaching all the time either. Because I want you to know that God's in you and he loves you. And the love of the Father transcends anything you've ever known. You've never experienced it. And I'm telling you, I, I've, I've walked through failure. I've fallen. I've failed. As a minister, as a husband, I have failed. And I went through a dark, dark season. And in the darkest moment of my life, you know who was waiting for me? The Father. I sat in a counseling session and I was waiting because I had pronounced so much judgment over the years. God expects holiness and righteousness and obedience unquestioned, unwavering. And I still believe that. And I preached it. And when preachers made mistakes, I'd be like, man, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve to ever do. And I was so judgmental and so, so strong in my judgments of others. And so I'm waiting on the hammer to fall on me. I walked around for months, impending doom coming. I'm waiting. The father's about to get me because I had such a wrong perception of who God really is. I sat in a session and I, I, I said, Lord, what's a lie that I believed? And this is what the Lord said to me. You believe that mercy triumphs over judgment for everybody else but yourself. And then they had me ask the Lord, what's a truth that you want me to know? And I didn't even get the words out of my mouth. And I heard the father speak to me. And he said, my mind has not changed about you. You are mine. Where I was expecting the judgment of God, I found the grace of God and the love of God. He's loving. He's worthy. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our life. He's worthy of it today. So he builds this house and the glory of God fills it. And so a transition takes place. Now it's moved beyond being something being done for him. Now it's actually of him because his glory's there. When God is behind something, he marked it with his presence. I don't know about you, but I want to live a presence-driven life, a presence-filled life. I want to be filled with the presence of God. I want to know that his presence is with me. His spirit is in me. He's working all things for my good. He's fighting on my behalf. He's fighting my battles that I can walk in triumphant victory because of my connection to a God who has never lost and he never will. And I want that to become the revelation because when you really get that, then life doesn't seem quite so hard. And that step of faith you're being called to take doesn't seem so big because I've got God in me. I've got Jesus living in me. So we're building, we're building a house. We're building a house. Every part of it is important. Every part of it is important. There wasn't one detail missed. There wasn't one thing neglected. They built a house for God. I'm gonna move on here because this is where we put the part that you play in this. 
Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to read all the verses to you. You guys go back and read all these. I encourage you to. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said he's laid a foundation. He said, no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the foundation piece of this house, right? Everything's being built on him. It's got to come back to Jesus. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the measuring. It's not what the the next church growth model looks like or what the next seminar says or what anything. It's Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the measuring. That's the starting point. Everything is measured from the cornerstone. When I used to lay out foundations for homes, we would we would lay out the foundation. We would set a point. This is where the house starts. Everything was laid out from there. Straight lines. So the foundation could be laid properly so that the house would align properly so that everything was square and everything was plumb and everything was right so that there was no compromise in the integrity of the structure being built. The foundation was crucial and it all started at one point. That's Jesus today. He's the cornerstone. Everything is measured from. So he says that no other foundation can be laid. And he said that when a man builds on that foundation, that we are to take heed how we build. We've got to take heed. We've got to pay attention to. We've got to guard over and protect and watch over what we build on this foundation. Do you understand that we're building on a foundation that was laid in the blood of Jesus and the blood of the apostles? This is eternal. This isn't just 2023. No, we're building on a foundation that Paul laid and Peter laid and John laid and and, and James and and all of these great men and and women of God. They, They laid the foundation with their own blood. And we get to be a part of that. And here's the reality. None of us are even being asked to die for him. We're just being asked to live for him. Just to build it. Just to build on the life. They laid their life down to build, to establish what we're walking in today. So it's it's important that we take heed, that we pay close attention to what we build and how we build. What is the standard? Does it glorify Jesus? Jesus. Does it build the body? Does it strengthen the body? Does it fortify us? Does it prepare us? Is Jesus being glorified in what we're doing? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, y'all read that. Take heed how you, how, you, how you build. Verse 16 in that, this is where you come into play. It says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? You, me, the, the born again, blood-bought believer, the son of God, the daughter of God, the daughter of the king. You, be, you are aliens. Now you've been brought into the family of God and he has marked you. The seal of that covenant was the earnest expect, the, the earnest uh, that was given, the deposit given was the Holy Ghost. Listen, we can't be afraid of the Holy Ghost. We're Pentecostal people. That's all right. It's not about how long your hair is or if you've got makeup on your face. That's not what I mean. No, you are Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. If you're not, let's fix that today. Because this this life, this gospel was never meant to be preached. This life was never meant to be lived devoid of the power of the living God, the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, go wait in Jerusalem until you receive power. He didn't say go wait until you speak in tongues. He said go wait until power comes inside of you so that you can stand up and boldly give witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe in tongues. I speak in tongues. I started doing that when I was seven years old. Laying in my bed, seven years old, fire of God all over me. I'm shaking, trembling in my bed. My dad's out preaching somewhere. I come out into the living room. My mom's on the couch watching TV and I walk in and she thought I'd had a bad dream. She thought something was wrong. I said, I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. She laid hands on me in our living room and I was gloriously baptized with the Holy Spirit at seven years old in my living room with my mom. I'm 42. I've been speaking in tongues a long time. I believe in that. But what I'm looking for more, I'm not impressed with your tongues. I'm looking for your power. Do you have power? Have you been endued with power from on high? Hallelujah. He said, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the tabernacle. You're the house for the Holy Ghost. He lives in you. 
He moves through you. He speaks through you. It's not reserved for prophets, the people that hear from God and speak for God. He lives in you. The Holy Ghost, the mouthpiece of God lives in you. He's speaking through you. He's just waiting on you to let him. He's just waiting on you to agree. He's in there. Let him out. Amen. Trying to get through this. I'm sorry. So we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. The glory is the kabod. It's the weighty or heavy presence of God. It's his manifest presence. When his glory came, it came more, it became more than a place. It became a place of him. It became a place where his glory dwelt, his presence was. He took possession of it. He marked it. And once that took place, it could never be used. Do you understand that when, when the Old Testament, when, when a, an article or a spoon, a bowl, anything that was taken, that was sanctified and set apart for the service of God's house, it could never be used for anything else. Once God's glory was placed on it, once it was set apart for the glory of God, for the use of God, so that bowl could never be used to put your cereal in again. <laughs> that was God's bowl. That was God's spoon. It belonged to him. It was sanctified, set apart for him. Well, I'm going to tell you this morning that he has put something in you. You've been marked. You've been branded. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Come on. In this world of liberty and freedom and my individual rights, and, and we live in a, the greatest country, democracy. I love the, 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 the freedoms that we have here. I've been around the world as well. I love America. I'm not the missionary that comes back and bashes America. I love America. There's things about this country that I absolutely love. There's things about this country I can't stand, but that's just another thing. But I love this country, but we are so concerned about our rights. You're violating my rights. Well, when I came into the kingdom and he put his spirit in me and he branded my heart, I forfeited my rights. He owns me. He owns me. But he can be trusted. That's the good news. His plans for me are good. He already has an expected end in mind for me. I can trust him with that. I can rely on him for that. That's good news today. So it's not a troublesome thing. It's not a burdensome thing. It's a liberating thing. That means he's got me. It means he's responsible for me. And he's good at it. Amen? So he's put his spirit in. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. First Peter chapter 2. It's just a lot of verses. I'm going to read all of them for time's sake. 1 through 10. You are living stones. Fitly joined together, building God a spiritual house. God is fitly, in, in the Old Testament, there could be no sound of a chisel at the site. So they would prepare these large columns, these large stones, they would literally chisel them off site. You guys need to study that. It's, it's amazing. There could be no sound of chisels and work, man's labor on the, in that site. So they literally would chisel it off site. Then they would bring it and they would sit it in its place and everything fit exactly the way it was supposed to go. It was absolutely amazing, astounding how they built it. Well, that's where you are. God's working and chiseling and he's, he's, he's forming and we're, we're clay on a potter's wheel and we don't like it and it's uncomfortable and he's working on the inside and working on the outside and he's conforming us to his image and he's changing us and he's marking us. Why? Because there's a place that he's going to put you that only you can fill. Your living stones being put together to build God a spiritual house and the marking of that house will be the glory of God. Not how many people sit here, not how full your church is, it's gonna be the glory of God. And in the glory of God, there is freedom. In the glory of God, there is, there is liberty, there is healing, there are miracles. When God shows up, supernatural things happen. It should just become the way we live our life. It should be the way we live. You should never come to church on a Sunday not expecting God to do something powerful. Come on. My heart 
is that it's just going to be an extension of what we've been walking in all week. I'm not waiting for Sunday. You know, that's what we do. And this is the last thing. I'm, I'm going to try to close. Your light that God put in you, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, but I'm leaving, and you're going to become the light of the world. That's not sacrilegious. That's what Jesus commanded. You're the light. Well, hear my heart in this. You don't need my light because you have your own light. My light is not for you. And this is what we do. We tend to come to church and just compliment each other's lights. Brother, you're shining really bright today. I appreciate you. Man, sister, it's shining in you today. And that's encouraging and that's great. But I don't need your light. I have my own light. The light of God is in me. Can I tell you that your light is not for you? Your light is for a world. Just this week, I was at the gym. I know you can't tell. I just started going, so don't judge me. I'll come back in a year. We'll see how I look. I'll be looking like David Vespa next year. Next year. Maybe. (laughs) But there's a young man that is there most days that I go, and he's from the Philippines, and he knows I'm a minister, but we talk about work, we talk about life, talk about all sorts of things. Well, this past week, he said, well, my, he, I love the way he said it. He said, I was in the Philippines. There's three, like there's several religions, but Muslims are a part of the country. He said, and then there's Catholics and then there's born again Christians. He said, my fiance, she's still in the Philippines. He kept calling her. She's a born again Christian. She's a born again Christian. I said, well, what are you? He said, I was raised Roman Catholic, but honestly, I don't really know if I'm anything. So I ended up taking most of my workout time this week to minister the word of life to him. And he said, do you mind next week? If you, are you going to be here on Tuesday? I said, I will now. So now I've got some real motivation. He said, I've got some questions. And he said, I don't have time to get into them all today, but would you mind if I come next week with some questions for you? I said, man, as long as you don't mind me working out while we, we answer them, I'm all for it. Let's do it. So I'm going to start loving on that guy. And I'm believing he's going to come into the kingdom of God. Why? Because my light isn't for me. My light's for him. He's looking for truth. He just doesn't know what it is. That's why you have light. You're living stones fitly joined together to build God a spiritual house. This house is not a house made with hands. It's a house that God builds and he builds it through people. The expression that God has chosen to use to release his glory in the earth is you and I. Why? I don't know. He's God. He could do it any way he wants to. He could just pour it out of heaven right now and everybody see it, but he chooses to manifest his glory through you. He chooses to let the expression of his power be done through his people. I don't know why he chooses to do it that way other than he loves the expression of the body of Christ. He loves the fact that he can put his power in you and his spirit in you and you can manifest that to a world who's desperate for it. That's what we're here for. We're here to glorify Jesus and to make his name known. I got news for you. I love the fact that David's wanting to take the gospel to people who have never heard it. But I got news for you. There's people in your neighborhood that don't know it. So we'll sow to missions and say, and we'll, we'll pat ourselves on the back, but we haven't, I, I mean, I, I struggle with it. I've got neighbors that are, that are on both sides of me that are Hindu. They don't believe in the God that we serve at all. And I'm asking God, show me how to bridge this gap so that I can share the love of Jesus with them and show them the way. I want to be a light to them. And I'm not an evangelist, but I am an evangelist because I've been given the good news. It's in me. I've got young men coming to my house with my son. My son is way more popular in school than I ever was. So I got a house full of teenagers a lot of days, a lot of times. There's boys at our house. And one boy in particular, and I won't say his name, but he came to our house. And I mean, he didn't know who Abraham was. He didn't know who Moses was. He knew who Jesus was because he went to Catholic school for one year. But that's all that kid knew. He's never been to church in his life right here in America, living in a pretty nice neighborhood, 
Mom works for the government, lives in an $800,000 house, has everything he needs in life, naturally, materialistically, but he's empty in his soul, and he has no revelation of Jesus whatsoever. But I know that he liked coming to our house because he liked being around us. And we're going to love him into the kingdom of God. My son's going to love those kids into the kingdom of God. I, I love missions, and I used to think that all my mission field was over there, but I'm telling you, I'm finding it. It's right in your backyard right now, guys. There's a world that needs it. And the thing that's going to mark us is the glory. We're living stones. How we build matters. Take heed how you build. How you build and where you build, it matters. You got to build on the rock. You got to build on the rock of Jesus. What we build matters. The Psalms chapter 127 verse 1 says that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Very familiar verse. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord watch the city, the watchmen watch in vain. So you, you guys have heard that verse, I'm sure. Here's the, the revelation of that, though. It doesn't say that you won't build it. So what that means is I can spend my life building something that God's not building. Because he didn't say the how, that they wouldn't build it. They just said they're building it in vain. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back, go into eternity looking back on my life, realizing that I had been investing in the wrong thing, building the wrong thing. I want to build what he's building. I want to partner with him. And you all have a part to play in that, where the, from the least to the greatest. And so I, I love that the heart of this place is to show honor to everybody, show honor to every person. We're many members of making up one body. You all have a function. You have a purpose. You have a plan. God saw you in this moment. Do you understand? This is something when I was up at, uh, in, in Charlotte a couple of months ago and on the airplane, the Lord spoke something to me and I grabbed my phone and I put a note in it to do, because I don't pay for Wi-Fi on airplanes. I don't do all that stuff. That's my quiet time. But I put it in my note to, uh, to think about it. When I landed, I grabbed my phone and I Googled it. Approximately how many days we've been on the earth since... Jesus walked the earth. Do you understand it's over 700,000 days? There's over 700,000 days that you could have been born on the earth. 700,000 opportunities for you to be born in the Middle Ages, to be born when Jesus was walking the earth. But God, in his foreknowledge, God in his predestination chose to put you on this planet for this time in this moment. And he's put prophetic destiny in you. And he's put power in you. And he's put his spirit in you. And he's put his nature in you. And he's doing that so that he can show himself powerful through his people. That's why you're here. So you're part of the body. We've got to all come together. There's a couple things real quick. I'm going to be done. That, that were important in 2 Chronicles 7. When they created this place for him, there was a few things that you find here. Each man was where he was supposed to be. Every person was in the place they were called to be. They had a function and they functioned in it. So there was unity. There was submission. I'm submitting to what God is asking me to do. I'm going to serve. I'm going to work. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to invest my life into the kingdom of God. And it's not so that I can earn my place in heaven. It's because I've already been given heaven. I don't work for, I work from. Massive difference. Ministers had prepared themselves. Their hearts were pure. They were ready. They had prepared themselves. They lifted up worship. Music and worship was sent up to glorify God in unison. They were worshiping God. So they had people in their place. Ministers were prepared. Music was, was there. The worship of their hearts was being lifted up to God. They prayed and they asked for him to come. Simple. Solomon asked him, would you come? And I know he's with us. He's in you. He never leaves you. I know that, but there is something about the corporate expression where the glory of God comes in a tangible way. And we've got to make sure that we're asking him to come. I don't want to go through services without him. I don't want to go through my workday without him. I'm asking him to come. I need him. Every hour I need him, amen? They prayed and asked him, and then his fire came. So sacrifice was made. 
The fire came and fell on it, and then the glory came. The last point I'll make, and I'm going to pray. Fire preceded glory. The church has been in a season where God is cleansing. Fire cleanses. The fire came, and then the glory fell. So the fire preceded the smoke. I believe that prophetically, there's been some, some cleansing. There's been some shifting. There's been some, some pruning that's taken place in here, in this church. This is what I'm going to speak to you prophetically. Fire had to kind of come and burn out some motives and some things. And there's some people not sitting in this place today because of it. And that's okay. Hear my heart. We wish, I pray blessings on. But there are people that aren't here today. I don't know who they are. Don't try to speculate either. Don't start looking around. I see some of y'all like, who's not here today? Just kidding. God cleansed. The fire came. Fire fell. And then the glory came. You've been in a season of transition and shifting and glory. The fire, the cleansing. God's cleansing motives. And he's cleansing. He's bringing clarity. He's bringing clarity of vision. And he's shifting things from from what it was to what he really intended. And that's, and that's all really good. And because you've been willing to do it and you've been able to adapt and adjust and make changes and shift and, and kind of shift the way things were being done to the way you feel like God's telling you to do it, I'm telling you that the next phase, the next thing is the glory. God's glory marking this place marking your services, marking your prayer room, marking your life, marking your homes, marking your jobs, marking your marriages, marking your children, the power and the glory of God marking, not one thing exempt, not one thing kept from him. Lord, you can have it all. I lay it all on the altar. I sacrifice it all to you. It's all worthy of, your, of, of you, God. You're worthy of all of it. I give it all to you. And when you do that, his fire comes and his fire brings clarity. It brings freedom. It brings liberty. It brings deliverance. It brings a, a purity of heart, a purity of motive. He's dealing with our motives. He's dealing with our hearts. He's dealing with our minds. And when we allow that to take place, he's going to fill us with his very presence, his glory. Don't undervalue the glory of God. It's life. His presence is life today. His presence is life today. Better is one day, better is one day in his courts, in his presence, surrounded by his glory than a thousand days spent anywhere else. Amen? You have a part, you have a place. The enemy wants to lie to you. He wants to isolate you. He wants to cause you to compare yourself and all of these lies and tricks and he's subtle and sly and all of his, he wants you to get offended. He wants you to misunderstand. He wants you to be disappointed, disillusioned. He wants to keep you in that place so that it becomes your expectation. That's where the enemy wants us to live because if we can keep us there, we'll never step into the place that God has for us. I don't want to see that for any of us today. I want, you to, I want to see you thriving and functioning and operating in the place that God's called you. Amen? And we pray, everybody bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you. Lord, you've already ministered in the altar today. It's so sweet. We thank you for touching hearts and lives. And Lord, I thank you for your presence in our midst. I thank you, Lord, that you're moving in our hearts. God, I thank you that today, Lord, I thank you that you are the sovereign living God. And I thank you, Lord, that you're a God who is able to move. You're able to fill us, God. You're able to fill us with your glory, fill us with your presence. And I declare over this ministry, God, I pray, Lord, I thank you that they are, they, they've seen your glory. They've experienced the move of your spirit. But God, I believe it's, it's, it was a foretaste of what's coming for this place. I ask God, Lord, we ask you to come. I ask you to come and begin to move in this place in ways they've never known before. God, it's going to show up in community. It's going to show up at kitchen tables. God, it's going to show up, God, in fellowship. It's going to show up at parks. It's going to show up, God, Lord, where, where two or three are gathering together in your name. You're going to be there in the midst of them. God, I thank you, Lord, where, wherever we gather, whatever we're doing, we invite you, God, into it. Lord, send your glory in Jesus' name. We need your glory. 
Your glory brings life and peace. It's your very presence. It's the essence of who you are, God. We need it. Help us not to live devoid of it, God. Help us not to live, God, to settle for a life without it, God. You paid such a tremendous price to give it. I pray that we would receive it. I pray that we would walk in it in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. I pray blessings over this house. Pray that you would send the people here, God, that need to be here. I thank you for the sending out, oh God, of those that you have called. Lord, I thank you this will be a place of sending, a place of sending many into the harvest fields. God, I thank you they're gonna go out, God, with a a revelation. They're gonna go out with a manifestation of your glory, God. Lord, I thank you for your glory is gonna cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God, let it be so. On the dark continent, God, I pray for your glory to be seen. Lord, in the nations of the earth, God, in the Middle Eastern nations, God, I pray for your glory to be seen. Lord, in the South American nations, God, I pray, Lord, for your glory to be seen. Lord, I pray all over this land, God, in Canada, Lord, I pray that your glory would be seen. Oh, God, that you would move, God, on the Gold Coast, God, Lord, I pray, Lord, God, in Australia, Lord, God, in in Europe, Lord, and Lord, every continent, every nation, God, until every ear is heard, until every eye has seen, God, let this glorious gospel of the kingdom of God be preached in all the world, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you help us to bring it to our neighborhood to our community pools, God, and Lord, to our jobs and to the gym. And God, whatever we do, Lord, as we live our lives, God, I pray your glory would be seen. Father, we thank you for it. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.